I'd like to welcome you. Uh, we're in week four of our series uh, called Remember. And the goal of this series is um, real plain and simple. We just want you to leave these services more encouraged than you war- were beforehand. That's it. And our anchor text for this series has um, it's been Psalm uh, chapter 103, which is a prayer that King David wrote uh, that for thousands of years God's people have turned to and used in order to get our own hearts to remember what is already true of us and what we already have access to uh, through a relationship with God. And in that prayer, there are five specific benefits that God is calling us and challenging us to remind ourselves of in His Word. And so we've been looking at each one of those benefits um, every week of this five-week series. Uh, So let me go ahead and read it to us again. I'm in Psalm 103. Verses 1 through 5, it says this. My soul, praise Yahweh, and all that is within me, praise his holy name. My soul, praise the Lord, and do not forget all his benefits. Verse 3, he forgives all your sin. He heals all your diseases. He redeems your life from the pit. He crowns you with faithful love and compassion. He satisfies you with goodness. Today, we're going to spend some time looking at this fourth benefit that the psalm calls us to remember, which is that God crowns us with faithful love and compassion. Um, So the first thing that caught my attention about this benefit is is, uh, the, the word crowns, that God crowns us. The Hebrew word that's used there can actually have two uh, seemingly different meanings. Uh, First and foremost, this word can mean to literally give a crown to someone, to bestow a crown on someone's head, which of course carries with it the connotation of, uh, you know, significance, that you're, you're, you know, declaring them royalty, you're setting them out apart, you know, from everyone else uh, in a given kingdom. Um, but the other way that this word can be used is in, in, instead of, you know, giving a crown, what it can literally mean is to actually physically surround someone in a military setting, not to attack them, but to actually sort of uh, hedge them in and protect them um, on all sides from an attack at any angle. And so the first question that I had when I, when I looked at this benefit is what is David actually m- talking about here? Is he saying that God literally crowns us with faithful love and compassion, uh, meaning that his love bestows on us this incredible kind of significance? Or is David saying that God actually surrounds us with faithful love and compassion, meaning that his love provides us with this all-encompassing, lifelong security? And the answer, according to the rest of Scripture, is yes. Christianity uh, teaches that the moment that you come to God the Father with a posture of heart that says, Father, accept me on the basis of what Jesus has done for me, the moment that you come to God with that posture of heart ready to trust in Jesus as your Lord and Savior, that from that moment forward, uh, you have a, a significance and a security in the love of God that nothing and no one will ever be able to take away from you. And so what I want to do today is look at a parable that Jesus taught that sort of hopefully will bring that abstract truth to life for us. It's probably, um, arguably, I would say, the most famous parable that Jesus taught during his uh, earthly ministry, uh, it's sometimes called the parable of the prodigal son or the lost son, um, although it's mislabeled, as we're going to talk about today. Um, I'm, I'm in Luke chapter 15. I'm going to read the whole parable to you. It's verses 11 through 32, and th- then we'll get into it. It says, Jesus also said a man had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the estate I have coming to me. So he distributed the assets to them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered together all he had and traveled to a distant country where he squandered his estate in foolish living. After he'd spent everything, a severe famine struck the country, and he had nothing. Then he went to work for one of the citizens of that country who sent him into his field to feed pigs. He longed to eat his fill from the carob pods the pigs were eating, but no one would give him any. So when he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired hands have more than enough food? And here I am dying of hunger. I'll get up 
go to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired hands. So he got up and went to his father. But while the son was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran, threw his arms around his neck, and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and in your sight. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father told his slaves, quick, bring out the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Then bring the fattened calf and slaughter it and let's celebrate with a feast because this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Now his older son was in the field As he came near the house, he heard music and dancing, so he summoned one of the servants and asked what these things meant. Your brother's here, he told him, and your father has slaughtered the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. Then he became angry and didn't want to go in, so his father came out and pleaded with him, but he replied to his father, look, I have been slaving many years for you, and I've never disobeyed your orders, yet you never gave me a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came, who's devoured your assets with prostitutes, you slaughtered the fattened calf for him. Son, he said to him, you're always with me, and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice, because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. This is God's word. So I mentioned this story has, has historically been called the prodigal son, or actually in my version of the Bible, the title uh, is, is the parable of the lost son. Uh, and in calling it that, it's actually totally mislabeled because as you just heard, this story is not about one son, it's about two sons. And Jesus' desire in, in giving this, this parable about 2,000 years ago, um, what he is trying to get us to do is to compare and contrast these two sons. And I've heard it said that one of the most powerful things about this parable is that when it's rightly understood, it shows us in a really vivid way that every thought the human race has ever had about what it means uh, to connect with God has been wrong. And that, as I hope to show you in about 30 minutes here, uh, is an incredibly encouraging thing. So the first thing to do here is look at what exactly happens in this story. It's made up of two acts. And we'll walk through them one at a time. Act 1 tells the story of a lost younger brother. Act 2 tells the story of a lost older brother. And Act 1 begins with a, uh, just a breathtakingly disrespectful speech delivered by the younger of the two brothers to the father in which he says something um, that no son would have had the gall to say to their father in Jesus' day. It's recorded for us in verse 12. It says, The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the estate I have coming to me. Uh, so in, in this day, according to the law of, of, uh, called primogeniture, um, a father in this scenario, when he died, he would leave two-thirds of estate to the older son, one-third of, of the estate to the younger son. But uh, important caveat here, that only happened when the father died. And so for a younger son to approach his father and say what this younger son just said to his father in this story was the equivalent of saying, I just wish you'd hurry up and die. Uh, it, 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 is, it is exactly as though he's just come to his father and said, listen, I don't love you. I don't care about you. I don't want a relationship with you. However, I'm very interested in what I can get from you. So I'm, I'm, frankly, I'm exhausted with playing this game where you're my dad and I'm your son. Uh, I'm not patient enough to wait for you to stop breathing. I just want you to give me everything that I have coming to me right now. Now, in Jesus' culture, which was a shame and honor culture, it was a very traditional communal culture, and it was a very patriarchal culture, it would have been completely acceptable for the father in this story to, to literally to beat his son and to excommunicate him from the estate and from the community at large where his son would go on to live the rest of his days out in shame. Nobody would have blamed the father for doing that. But as breathtaking uh, and audacious as his son's request was, the way the father responds in this story is exactly as kind of breathtaking and audacious because he actually grants the request. 
And I imagine that the father was thinking, okay, for my son to come to me and ask what he just asked me clearly means that we have a significant rift that has grown in our relationship. Maybe if I grant my son's request and he sees that I'm willing to literally take one-third of everything I've worked my whole life for, that's one-third of the land, one-third of the estate, one-third of everything needs to get liquidated and given to this son, I'm sure the father's thinking, maybe if I actually do that, he'll see how much I love him and we can start to sort of figure this thing out. But then just to prove exactly how little this younger son cares about his father, once he gets the inheritance, he gets as far away from his father as possible, goes to a far-off country. And once he gets there, uh, he almost immediately falls flat on his face. You know, the scripture says that he, he practiced foolish living. Uh, you know, he's, he's saying yes to every idea, every impulse, every desire of his heart. And so he, he, he quickly um, wakes up one day to find that he is, he's, he's dead broke, he's alone. He's out in the fields looking to eat alongside of pigs. This is a, the absolute lowest of rock bottoms that a Jewish man could hit in Jesus' day. I don't even know that we can really relate to what exactly has happened to this young man here. Um, you know, I, I'm, sh- I'm sure some, of, if not all of us, can relate in, in some way with what it is to, to feel like you hit a rock bottom. But in Jesus' day, uh, for, for God's people, pigs were ceremonially unclean. And they made you ceremonially unclean in the eyes of God when you were, you know, just around them. And, and so for this young man to leave his father's estate and he wakes up and now he's, he's, he's longing to eat alongside pigs this is a kind of shame, a kind of rock bottom. I don't, I don't really think we even have a category for it. But anyway, when he gets there, he comes to himself, and he starts to have this inner dialogue, and he puts together a plan to get back to the Father. And you read about that in, in, in verse uh, it's 18 and 19. Here's his plan. He says, I'll get up. I'll go to my Father. I'll say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and in your sight. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son, so make me like one of your hired hands. And and, and I mean, all that is, you know, maybe, maybe to a, a modern Western person, you're wondering, well, why doesn't the son just kind of throw himself at the mercy of the court and say, please take me back, I'm so sorry. I'm a... in, in that culture, it just didn't work that way. In a shame and honor culture, this, this young man knew what rabbis would have taught, that his sin was a sin against the community, and he's got to work his way back into that community, and, and he's probably never going to work his way back into that community. The young man knew that, and so his plan is to come back to his father and say, listen, I know I can't be your son anymore. I know that I've, I've ruined that, that that ship has sailed, that that's, that's not even on the table. At least let me be a hired hand, meaning at least let me work for you so that I can try to pay you back for some of the damage that I've caused you. And with that, this young man begins the long journey home. And so then Jesus turns and he gives us the perspective of the father. And the way that Jesus tells the story, it's as though the father has been looking for his son's return since the moment he's been gone. And the moment that that disrespectful son silhouette appeared on the horizon, the father begins running toward his son, which I'm sure the son was wondering, is that even good news that my dad's running towards me given all that I've done to him? But, but the way that, that Jesus tells the story, the father essentially tackles his son. He throws his arms around him. He starts kissing him, which again, this man has just been dining alongside of pigs. So he, he, he looked terrible, he smelled worse than he looked, and none of that matters to the father. And at this point, the, the, the son begins to try uh, to deliver this speech that I'm sure he'd been rehearsing with pits in his stomach every step of the way on that long journey home. But what's remarkable, if, if you carefully read the story, he doesn't even get to say the part about, can I just be one of your hired hands, before the father cuts him off and basically says, hey, shut up, we don't have any time for that. And he starts yelling to the servants that were around, telling them to prepare for this celebration that he has in mind. And so he tells them to put his finest robe on uh, his son's back and a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. All of that's incredibly significant because those were essentially artifacts that conveyed your standing in the family system. And so this is the father's way of saying, listen, you never stopped being my son. And even when you were all the way out there, as far from me as you could get, my heart was with you every single moment. And so now that you're back, there's no time for this nonsense about apologies and whether or not you're worthy in a hired hand. We just need to party. It's time to celebrate. Now, the reason that that I say this has been mislabeled is because, you know, this is traditionally called the prodigal son or the lost son. And if that's what this story was, if it was just about a prodigal son, that's exactly where it would have ended. And frankly, it's a beautiful story. And that's like, you know, a feel-good kind of Disney, Hallmark, Christmas movie ending. That's amazing. But Jesus isn't done with the story. 
he continues telling Act 2, and in Act 2, we read that we have another brother here, the older brother. And so the older brother, he's working out in the field. He hears all this commotion coming from his dad's house, and he asks a nearby servant what is going on. And the servant tells him, well, your father's celebrating because your younger brother has returned home, except the servant does not just say your dad's celebrating. He says your dad has slaughtered the fattened calf. Uh, which is actually um, something that made the older brother so furious that he then refuses to go in. And so the father actually has to run out to his oldest son and plead with him, and they have an exchange, and we read about that exchange in verses 29 and 30. Here's what the older son says to his father. It says, but he replied to his father, look, I have been slaving many years for you, and I have never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came, notice he doesn't even refer to him as his brother. He says, when this son of yours came, who has devoured your assets with prostitutes, you slaughtered the fattened calf for him. You notice all this emphasis on the fattened calf. The reason for that is because in Jesus' day, first and foremost, you almost never had meat at a meal. That was a delicacy that just wasn't nearly as common as it is today. But even when you did happen to have meat as a part of the family meal, eating, eating the fattened calf was, was literally, for, for most people, if it ever happened at all, it was truly a once-in-a-lifetime kind of thing. Uh, theologians and, and, and commentators will tell you that, that a fattened calf would feed around 75 to 100 people. So this wasn't a family meal. This wasn't like the father and the younger son are kind of waiting for the older son. This is the kind of thing that the entire community was invited to the estate for. And so the older brother here has shown incredible disrespect to his father, not only in the way that he spoke to his father, but in the fact that he's just publicly shamed his father by refusing to go into the celebration that his father is called. And so for the second time in this story, this father has been publicly humiliated in a shame and honor culture by his own children. So at the end of this parable, the question that we're left asking is, what's going to happen? You know, are they going to work out the kinks? Is the older brother going to come in and they're going to figure it out and live happily ever after? And, and as was so often Jesus' want, he refuses to answer the question for us. We're left hanging. It's this cliffhanger ending where we're all on the edge of our seats. And it, of course, raises the question, what exactly are we supposed to see in this parable? Uh, and the truth is, uh, there's all kinds of things to see here. Uh, the, the, the hardest part of this teaching for me was figuring out what I didn't have time to say because there's so many themes and there's so many details. You could make a whole sermon series out of just this parable. But uh, the main thrust of this parable that, that Jesus is, is doing in this parable for the people 2,000 years ago and for us today is he's giving us a far deeper understanding of what sin actually is and what a relationship with God actually is. In the first act of this story, you know, if you, if you ask yourself the question, what does sin look like to you? What do you think of when you think of sin? What Jesus does in the first act of this story is he shows us the picture of sin that we're all used to. Everybody looks at the younger brother in this story and say, that's what sin is. You know, flagrant disrespect, uh, you know, wanton self-indulgence, absolute, you know, total loss of control and sexual immorality and all that kind of stuff. That's what everybody thinks of when they think of sin. In fact, that's why this parable has traditionally been called the parable of the lost or prodigal son, because people have so focused on the outward, obvious, blatant sin of the younger brother that they've missed the forest for the trees and missed the entire point of the parable. But in the second act, what we're shown here is that there's two sons in this story. Now, one of these sons is, is very bad. The other one of these sons is very good. But what's so interesting is that as Jesus tells the story, both of these sons are equal in that both of them are alienated from the father because what they have in common is neither one of them really loves the father for who he is. Both of them are simply after what they could get from him. And it's plain as day, it, it's, it's far more obvious with the younger brother, but it's no less present with the older brother. And you see it in the exchange that the older brother and the father have, which we just looked at. Right in, in verses 29 and 30, uh, let me just read that to you again. He says to the father, I've been slaving many years for you, and I've never disobeyed your orders, yet you never gave me a young goat so I could celebrate. 
Now, if I can just draw your attention to two things here. First off, notice the older brother talks about what he's been doing for the father as slaving. And he refers to the father's desires, not as desires, but orders. I've been slaving under your orders, is what the older brother is saying. If I can just point out the obvious here, that is not relational language. That is highly transactional language. In other words, what's clear is that the older brother for maybe all of his life, had never looked to his father like a father. He'd been looking to his father like a boss. And he goes on and he, and he clearly states what the motive behind all his working was, that it was never about the father, it was just about the father's stuff. Uh, when he says how angry he is and offended he is, that, man, my younger brother got this calf, meanwhile, you've never even given me a goat. And what that proves is that he was just as much after his father's stuff as his younger brother was. The only difference was, to the younger brother's credit, at least he was honest about it. He didn't feel like playing games like his older brother did. Um, but then at the end of this parable, something really shocking happens, which is that the, the younger brother, that everybody would look at and say, oh man, they're so bad, they're so beyond redemption, that you know, they've made such a mess of their life, that brother makes it into the father's feast Meanwhile, this older brother, who everybody would look at and say, eh, it's such a hardworking, you know, tax-paying, upright kind of model citizen, that brother never makes it in. And the irony of it is that it's not flagrant, outward, open acts of immorality that keep the older brother from his father. It's actually his flagrant, outward, open acts of morality that keep him from his dad. It's not his bad deeds, it's his, it's his good deeds that it's so separated from the heart of his father. So why would Jesus tell a story like this? If you go back to the beginning of Luke chapter 15, you'll read that there was two very distinct groups gathered around Jesus when he delivered this parable and the two that came before it. The groups of people were on the one hand, you had uh, the tax collectors and the sinners, and on the other hand, you had the, the Pharisees and the scribes. And those group of, groups of people are represented in the two sons of this story. The sinners are the younger brothers. These are the people who basically live however they want with no regard for the moral rules in life. Uh, the Pharisees and the scribes are the older brothers. These are the people who uh, actually keep all the rules and look like these model citizens that everybody wants their kid to grow up to be like. But what Jesus is showing here in the most powerful way possible, is that sinners and Pharisees were really just two sides of the same coin and were equally lost because they were both doing what they were doing for the same fundamental reason. Uh, I don't know if you've ever heard anybody say this before. I, I, actually, I'm, I'm certain that you have heard someone say this before. Let me walk that back. Uh, I feel like this became nauseatingly popular in the mid to late 90s when everybody had a WWJD bracelet on one of their arms, that Christianity is not a religion. Uh, that, that's, that's become so kind of commonplace and, and a little bit nauseating that it's lost its punch. I, I just think it's worth pointing out here, um, we didn't make that up in the United States of America in the 20th century. Uh, that actually came from the Roman Empire. This, this might sound really strange to some people, but when Christianity, first off, before they called it Christianity, it was simply called the way because people had no idea what to categorize it as. They just knew it was a new way of life. And people would actually refer to it as an anti-religion. And, and, and later on in the, uh, in the second and third century AD, when Christians began to be put to death, in the Roman Empire, when they, would, when they would slaughter Christians in the arena, people would actually chant death to the atheists as Christians died. And this sounds so strange to us, but the reason that they called Christianity an anti-religion and Christians themselves atheists is because people knew when they heard the message of Christianity that whatever this was, it was not a religion. And, and it's parables like this that prove why people understood that. Because when you look at, at this way of life that Jesus is prescribing, that, that, that the gospel creates, it's appropriate to say that Christianity is not irreligion or religion. It's not morality or immorality. It's just something different altogether because it, de it, it deals with something deeper altogether. Scripture says that the fundamental problem of the human heart, underneath all of our surface level behavior, from the day that we rebelled against God and walked out on him in Genesis chapter three, that really the problem with the human heart is that underneath everything we do or don't do, there is this stubborn, fervent desire for the human heart to get out from under God's authority and be its own master, savior, and Lord. 
We all do that. Now, we want what God has to offer. We want meaning. We want an identity. We want fulfillment. We want satisfaction. We want God's stuff, but we don't want to go through him to get it. The human heart has no desire to naturally submit to God. And everyone, since sin has entered the world, uh, goes about that, that rebelling against God and getting out from under his authority as either one of the brothers in this story. All right, younger brothers, who you could say today are more modern people, more irreligious people, more secular people, more pro progressive people, you know, whatever term you like. Younger brothers get out from under God's rule by living however they want. You know, they, they live according to kind of the one commandment of secularism, which is that your responsibility in life is to look into your heart, whatever desire you find there, you have to pursue that with everything that you have, no matter what anybody tells you is right or wrong, because you stand no chance of being happy if you don't. That's a, that's a classic younger brother mindset that's still carried forth today, uh, even in our culture. But older brothers get out from under God's authority uh, in the most subtle and ironic way possible, which is actually by trying to keep all of God's rules rather than break them. Which raises the question, how could you be living in rebellion to God by simultaneously trying to keep his rules? And this story shows it as clear as day. The thought process for older brothers is that as long as I live a good life, God owes me. He owes me a good life. And what that usually results in, just like it did in the scribes and Pharisees, is a life that looks very morally polished on the surface. But here's the reality. If underneath your morality, if underneath your good deeds, you believe that as long as you live a good life, God has to give you a good life, and God has to answer your prayers, and God has to save you, and God has to spare you from the suffering that people who haven't lived as good a life as you might experience, that God owes you those sorts of things, then at bottom, you're not serving God. You're trying to get God to serve you. And you're certainly not trusting Jesus to be your savior. You're trusting in your own ability to save yourself. And what that actually means is that underneath all of your morality at bottom is that your good deeds are just a pathetic attempt to try to manipulate God into giving you the good life that you think you deserve. Whew. Yeah. It's, it's not the easiest thing to hear, but there was no more powerful way for Jesus to, to cause Pharisees and scribes and merely religious people to come face to face with that than this parable. And so the question after reading this is what brother do you identify with? It's not do you identify with them, it's just which one are you more like? And the truth is, I'm sure there's more nuance to it than that. I can look back in my life and say that I've been one and then the other at different times. But this parable is meant to be, like all scriptures, meant to be a mirror that you look into to see yourself. Now, here's the, here's the deal. If you identify with the younger brother, I don't think it takes a whole lot of convincing because you know what you're about. You know, all of your sins are open and obvious and, and, and outward. And even if it's not obvious to you, there's a good chance God in his providence has put some older brothers in your life to tell you how bad of a sinner you are. However, what this parable also goes on to teach is that older brothers are usually the last people to see the truth about themselves if they ever do. Because, notice, in this parable, the older brother is shown to never face himself, to never, you know, kind of peel back the veneer and see who he really is, humble himself, repent, and go in to the feast with the Father. That's because, you know, merely religious people who are relying on their own morality to save them and, and in the most sub subtle and subliminal way uh, rebelling against God, they, they, are, they usually have this kind of spiritual blindness to their own need for grace. And, and so the question is, how do you know if you are one? And so what I'd like to do before I move on to the last move today is I want to give you three, based on this parable, I want to offer you three things uh, that serve as a diagnostic tool that will tell you if you have an older brother's spirit, based on this parable. How do you, how do you know, the question I'm asking, how do you know if, if you're just a good person whose heart is exactly as far from God as the younger brother in this story? I think that's a question that's worth answering. How do you know? How do you know if we're that prone to self-deception? There's three things that will show up in your life if you have an older brother's spirit. Number one, and this is the most obvious, self-righteousness. Uh, it, it always amazes me how many people, maybe out in the world or new to church, are so put off by self-righteousness, and, and, and that sometimes turns them away from Jesus, because I always want to say, hey, you and Jesus have that in common. He hated self-righteousness just as much as you do. And in this story, what we're being shown here is that the, the, the clearest, most surface-level hallmark of an older brother's spirit is, is that you have a strong sense of your own moral superiority, which causes you to then look down on other people. 
You notice in this story that the older brother is talking about how good of a life that he's lived compared to that that younger brother who he he can't even call him his his, his brother anymore. He just says, this son of yours to his dad. Now he's he's pointing out the flaws in his his younger brother. That's how older brothers go through life. And so in churches, older brothers are, are, you know, they're polished. They, they, you know, you can't look at their life and see any kind of obvious sin or obvious flaw or obvious, you know, I can get them on that thing. But what they do is they spend a lot of time thinking about, if not talking about, uh, and sort of dwelling on and pointing out all of the, the, the things that, that other people struggle with that, you know, I would never struggle with. And what older brothers move through life blind to is the reality that their arrogance is just as ugly as the sin they so easily point out in the lives of other people. I feel like there's a lot of those super long sentences that I had to get off my chest today. I'm like out of breath up here. I'm sorry. It's self-righteousness. <clears throat> Number two, uh, bitterness. Uh, the other way you can know you are driven by an, elder brother, an older brother spirit is if when your life does not go the way you wanted it to, you're not just sad, you're bitter. And there is a world of difference between those two things. Meaning, there is a world of difference between grieving the loss of a life that you really wanted, but God had other plans, which is totally, that's a biblical thing to do. That is a wise thing to do, to grieve the loss of things that are grievous. Scripture actually commands us to do that. But there's a world of difference between that and and bitterness. Because bitterness is a fire that is fueled by the belief that I deserve better. Right? Older brothers move through life Like we said, driven by this idea that if I live a good life, God owes me a good life. And so because they're always thinking about their morality and all the good things that they've done and how lucky God must be or my church must be or my family must be to have someone like me, they're always believing this idea that they deserve a better life than the one they have. And so if you have an older brother's spirit, when you look around at other people that are doing better than you in some area of life, even if you can fake it for a time, older brothers lack the ability to rejoice with those who rejoice. Because underneath that all, they're they're always thinking, why them and not me? There's a constant low-grade bitterness that sometimes isn't even that low-grade. But thirdly, this will be the last one, and this one might surprise you, is actually fear. Uh, the, the, the final thing, and I actually think this is the core, the core of what creates an older brother spirit in somebody is that somewhere along the line, fear has taken up residence where love should reside. Let me explain what I mean there. What creates an older brother spirit and all the brokenness that it leads to is that instead of a love-driven obedience, there is a fear-based compliance. And remember, you see that as clear as day in the way that the older son talked to his father when he says, all these years I've been slaving for you. Now, what's clear there is is his service to his father was not driven either by love for his father or an awareness that his father loved him. What the older brother just revealed there is that probably for his entire life, all of his service, all of his motivation, he was driven by this fear that just like a slave, he was one mistake away from getting kicked out. And he goes on to prove that by saying, you know, my, my, my younger brother, he gets the, the, the fattened calf slaughtered for him, but you've never even given me a goat. You hear the insecurity in that. What he's, what he's saying to his father is, you've never celebrated me. You've never rejoiced over me. You've never made a big deal out of me. What he's saying is, I'm not really confident that you love me. And that, that, that's one of the things that I think is so ironic about an older brother's spirit is that despite the bravado and the self-assertion and the condescension and the sense of superiority, that underneath all that, there is a terrible, uh, caustic, uh, tumultuous insecurity. What Jesus is, is trying to get us to see here is that older brothers are driven through life by the fear that maybe I'm not enough for God. Can you feel the gravity of that? That's what creates all of it. And when you move through life that way for any length of time, that that you don't have an assurance of God's love any longer, what that will always lead to is exhaustion because you feel like the older brother, like you're slaving for something. The scripture says no matter how hard you work, you're never gonna be able to achieve, but you can receive by grace through faith in the name of Jesus. And with that, you're gonna be destroyed by other people's opinions of you because your heart isn't really settled about what God says about you. You're gonna feel guilt long after you've repented of your sin and your failure in the past, and you're gonna have a dry or a non-existent prayer life. Why? Because you, you just have no sense that God is a heavenly father that really wants to hear from you. 
So self-righteousness, bitterness, and fear. If you see them in you, then, then you're an older brother. And, and, and uh, this will be the final thing I say here. And I hope this doesn't come across the wrong way. But, you know, congregations take on a personality. You know, groups of people tend to take up, uh, you know, one overarching kind of, you know, it, it's like a big body. That's what, I mean, that's what the church is. It's a, it's a big body with a lot of individual bodies. If I was a betting man, I would say that our church, more often than not, is filled more with older brothers than younger brothers. And I'm saying that because... That's the, that's the truth about me. Uh, now, I'm sure that there, there are younger brothers with us today. And like I said, I'm sure that you can look back in your life and see times when you've been one and then the other, maybe even different areas of your life where you're one and the other. But, but the point of this parable, at the end of it, uh, what we should be asking is, which brother are you? Does all the stuff that I just said resonate with you? Or are you more like the younger brother? Either way, it's important to realize there's no good option here. <laughs> Jesus isn't saying one of these is good and one of these is bad because the core underneath both of them is the same. We just don't love God like we should. And it leads to all kinds of, of unwise decision and outward brokenness and inward brokenness and turmoil in our lives. And so the question that we're left with here that Scripture so often leaves us with is how do you change How do you break out of these broken ways of relating to God and actually experience inside out deep level change in your life? And the answer is exactly what David is talking about in Psalm 103 verse four. The answer is you need to experience what it is that God crowns you with faithful love and compassion. In other words, you need to experience in a personal way the significance and the security that you have in the love of God. So I I pointed this out earlier, but let me return to it now. In this parable, the irony is that the younger brother who's lived this terrible life makes it back into the father's family where the older brother remains outside. So here's the question that I had as 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 I read that and just kind of reflected on that this week. I just asked the simplest of questions. What's the difference between the two of them? You know, and I understand their behavior on the outside is different, but, you know, at bottom, they're really the same. So what is the difference that brought the younger brother in that didn't bring the older brother in? That's the question that I have, because one of these guys makes it and one of them doesn't. And in hearing that question, you might think, well, obviously, the answer is the younger brother humbled himself. You know, he got knocked into the dirt. He's next to pigs. He's got nowhere else to go. So he repents and he comes back to the father. That's why he made it in. I just want to tell you, and this might surprise you, if that's your read on what this parable is teaching, I think you've missed Jesus' point entirely. Because remember that when this younger brother decides to come back to the father, he puts together that plan with that little speech in his mind, his plan was to come back to the father and work as a hired hand. That's really significant. He didn't say slave, he said hired hand. And there's a difference between the two of them. A hired hand was someone who did not live on the father's estate. They lived in town and they worked on the estate. And so what the, what the younger brother was saying is, all right, I'll come back. And I, I understand relational intimacy is not even an option. So I'll just work there to try to pay off the debt. It's almost as though the younger brother is saying, you know what? Maybe my older brother had it right the whole time. You know, I've always looked down on him. I always thought he was an idiot because he's slaving away with dad's orders. But, you know, my way of life hasn't worked. Maybe I'll try his way of life. And so, yeah, he, he planned to come back to the father, but he didn't make it back on his own. He still didn't get it. He still didn't understand what a relationship with the father was like. And Jesus' point here is that nobody makes it back to the father on their own. And what I mean by that is nobody wakes up one day and says, you know what I feel like doing today? Loving the Lord my God with all my heart, mind, soul, and strength. The human heart just doesn't work like that. The way that you and I change, the way that we break out of these broken ways of relating to God, the way that we gain access to the family of God and to an ever-deepening, life-transforming relationship with God, the only way that's ever going to happen for you and I is if we experience what the younger brother experienced in this story. We need to experience what it is to have the Father, I'll make it personal, you need to experience what it is to have the Father pursuing you, running after you, embracing you, kissing you, clothing you, honoring you, rejoicing over you because he loves you that much. When you experience, when the human heart experiences that that kind of love, that's when real change begins. Now, if, if I were you, and I heard what I just said, the first thought in my mind would be, well, obviously, if I experience what the younger brother experienced, my heart would melt. Obviously, if I experienced God as a father pursuing me, of course that would change me. 
But I say all of this to say the gospel says God has already pursued you like that. And he has done so in Jesus. And this whole parable points to the finished work of Jesus in a very subtle but a very brilliant way. I'm almost done here. I just ask you to really lean in here because if, if, if you got everything but missed this, then this really has been a waste of time. In this story, I think if you're being honest, it looks like the forgiveness that the father extends to the younger brother is, is costless. Does it not? When, when the younger brother, who has just cost the father one-third of the entire family estate, comes home and tries to pay the father back, the father cuts him off and says, hey, no time for that, just come on in. That looks like costless forgiveness. That looks like cheap grace, but it's not if you understand the culture of the day. I don't know if you caught this detail, but at the end of this parable, when the father is talking to the older brother, you notice he tells him, son, you've always been with me and all I have is yours. That's what he says to the older brother. He wasn't speaking figuratively. In a legal sense, that was true. Because at the beginning of this story, when the younger son asked for his share of the inheritance and the father obliged, he literally liquidated one third of all he owned and gave it to the younger son. That means in a legal sense, the remaining two thirds of that estate did legally belong to the older brother. Now, I just ask you for a second to consider what that means. That means the robe and the ring and the sandals that the father gave to the younger brother and the, and the fattened calf that he slaughtered for the younger brother, all of that technically, legally belonged to the older brother. And all of the cost associated with bringing that younger brother back into the family, all of that was coming directly out of the older brother's pocket. That's why he was so furious, because he understood that the only way to bring that younger brother and restore him to the family was at the cost, at the expense of the older brother. That's why he was so livid that he couldn't even bring himself to come to the celebration. And, and so in telling us all that, yeah, of course, Jesus is challenging Pharisees, and, and, and he's, you know, he's pointing to the ugliness of self-righteousness. But even more than that, what Jesus is inviting the hearer of this parable to do is to consider what a good older brother would have done. And you know the answer to that. What a good older brother would have done when he heard that his younger brother had gone off, the first thought in his mind would be, he's never going to find what he's looking for out there. Those people don't love him. They're not going to care about him. They're not going to be there for, for him when the bottom falls out. He belongs in this family, and I'm going to go get him. A good older brother would have pulled his younger brother out of those pigsties himself, and he would have walked with him every step of the way back to the father's house, carried him if necessary, and paid any price, paid any price to make sure that his brother was restored to that family. And so when you zoom out from this parable, finally, what you're left with is the reality that the poor younger brother in this story did not have a good older brother, but I'm telling you, the gospel says that you do. <laughs> do you see that? The gospel says that in Jesus, you have the, the, the true older brother who was willing to leave heaven, to leave his father's estate, to leave his glory and his majesty and everything that was rightly his to come to earth to find you. And he brings you into the father's family, not at the cost of his inheritance, but at the cost of his life. And at Calvary, what we actually are bearing witness to is that Jesus Christ was stripped naked. Why? So you and I could be clothed in the father's robe. Jesus Christ was forsaken. Why? So we could be embraced, so that we could have a seat at the father's table. And when you see that, when your heart is moved by that, and to the degree that you understand that, it transforms you. It changes your whole life from something other than a younger brother who openly disrespects God or an older brother who subtly uses him. It transforms you into a Christian who loves God the Father simply for who he is and what he's done for you by grace through faith in the name of Jesus. So I'm gonna call the worship team up. We're, we're gonna close today like we've been closing all of these weeks, which is by celebrating communion together. Communion is something that Jesus gave us as a tool that's meant to help remind our own hearts of who he is and what he's done for us. And as we take communion together, uh, just a moment here, uh, we're, we're gonna do so uh, after reflecting for several minutes on this benefit that we've been talking about today that God crowns us, he crowns you with faithful love and compassion. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna read our anchor text today from Psalm 103. <clears throat> and I'm gonna give us several minutes to just spend some time with God to get right, to reflect. 
Um, but before I read this and, and, and we take uh, just a minute or two here, I would just ask you to consider something. The primary difference between the older brother and the younger brother in the parable of the two lost sons is that the older brother might have heard that the father loved him, but the younger brother experienced it personally. He felt the embrace, the kiss, the warmth of his father. And so as we take a few minutes here, I would just invite you to come before God and to ask him to make his love so real to you that you experience it in your heart so that it's changed, it, it, it results in change in your life. Psalm 103, verses 1 through 5. My soul, praise Yahweh and all that is within me. Praise his holy name. My soul, praise the Lord and do not forget all his benefits. He forgives all your sin. He heals all your diseases. He redeems your life from the pit. He crowns you with faithful love and compassion. He satisfies you with goodness. Let's go ahead and, and uh, take communion together. When, when Jesus first broke the bread with his disciples the night before he was betrayed, he said that this bread represented his body. And so as you take this bread, I invite you to remember the one who called himself the bread of life, who's come to be broken so that broken people could be made whole in him. Let's take the bread. When Jesus gave the cup, he explained to his disciples that this represented his blood that was spilled for the forgiveness of our sins. And so as we take the cup together, we remember that the grace of God is free, but it's anything but cheap. It came at the infinite cost, the only innocent man to ever live. Let's take the cup. Amen. I want to invite you to worship. Your goodness is running out. 
Amen. Amen. For, for those of you that join us today in person and those online, uh, it's my sincere desire uh, that you would leave here today knowing in a little bit more of a, of a life-changing way what it is that God crowns you, that by grace through faith in the name of Jesus, God the Father crowns you with faithful love and compassion. I hope that changes you. I hope that fulfills you. I hope that heals you in ways that it has not before. And this concludes our service today. Have a great week.